Hello everyone from Tony the Sky Ghost. Today I'm very honored to be here with Eduardo Simon. Uh, fantastic. We are uh, enthusiasts, but also angel investors, entrepreneurs, influencers, a lot of stuff. So um, thank you, Eddie, for the time you are giving me. Yeah, it's a, it's sorry about the phone there, you know. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Um, it, it, it's a great pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm so excited. Um, thank you for giving me the time. Um, I'm not like the rest of, of the people that you interview who are like, you know, doing these amazing things in the VR world. I'm just kind of like a little kid in a candy shop trying to see, you know, trying to, trying to eat some of the candy and enjoy, enjoy the VR AR world while, while doing my day job. But, um, so thank you so much. Um, and I hope, I mean, I, I want to learn from you as much as as much as possible during during this interview and um and it's been a great pleasure to to read all of your articles um i even read the ones about devices that i don't have i know how to i know how to remove the controller and the vive focus now <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and i really admire everything that um that you've done with your startup and the kind of learning how to bounce back from that and um yeah, I'm a I'm a huge admirer, obviously, of everything that you've done, and I'm very I'm very very thankful uh, to have a chance to talk to you. Well, it's it's the same for me. We I think we are all like babies in a candy shop that uh, we have lots of passion. I uh, love to be in VR, and we are all learning one from the other. So I'm honored as well to be with you and to let my readers uh, and my people watching me. Uh, be honored um, as me, uh, I'll ask you to introduce yourself, so who you are, what to do with your life, so who are you, Eddie? Yeah, so who am I? Um, right. So should we look at it from the Prussian perspective or Schopenhauer? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, um, so, so yeah, my name is Eduardo uh, Simon, Eddie Simon. Um, right now, uh, for the last six years, I've been working as IT director for Interdeco Apparel, um, which is my family business. Um, and uh, in in the past, I've done various jobs. Um, I, I worked at Goldman Sachs in in private banking. Um, I worked for Deloitte Consulting in SAP Consulting. Um, I have an MBA from Columbia, I, uh, where I did mathematical finance. Um, and I've just done a little bit of everything uh, throughout my life. Um, but really kind of where all of that led to was a, was a obsession with an incredible interest in new technologies. And that started really with big data um, and trying to understand Hadoop and Spark and, and how to do MapReduce and things like that. And I, I started blogging about that at the end of 2015, mostly just because I, didn't, I couldn't find anyone to talk about it. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know who to talk to about this, so I'm just going to blog about it. Um, and about early 2016, I ran into a paper by um, some professors at Caltech that was talking about data visualization uh, in virtual reality. And it just blew my mind. Um, and I reached out to them, and after um, they didn't respond to me for five months, and then finally five months later, um, one of them reached out to me and said, hey, you know, you wrote us this email that, you know, that you think that what we're doing is good. And I said, yeah, definitely. Let's let's talk. And little one thing led to the other. And I became their first angel investor. And and that company became Virtualytics. Um, and, you know, thank God that um, the company is doing very well. And um, I'm, I feel very honored to be a part of it. Um, and the founders are fantastic, wonderful people that have made a huge impact on my life. Um, and I'm very lucky to have met them. And from there, basically, <clears throat> I forgot all about big data and I focused my, all my interests on VR and AR. Um, and basically what I've been doing <clears throat> is trying to find a way to do my day job and also learn as much as I can about immersive experiences. And so one great way to do that is to um, give speeches about how you can use VR in e-commerce um, or, or VR and AR in e-commerce. So um, I started doing that uh, 
this year I gave my first uh, uh, big presentation about using using uh, virtual and augmented reality in e-commerce, um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna give a another one at Etail West in February, which is a big uh, e-commerce conference, and I'm super nervous. I because I'm just like everybody else, uh, you know, it's public speaking and, you know, <laughs> but, but it's great because what I can do is it's relevant to my job, right? Because e-commerce is huge. And um, for, for my customers here at Intradeco and for us at Intradeco, right? We obviously, we all want to figure out e-commerce and I get to learn about what's happening in VR and AR. So that's how I've been trying to combine it. But obviously like when I'm not at work, I'm like just, reading every paper I can find from SIGGRAPH. If it's Asia, Europe, I don't care where. I'm on Twitter trying to find out who's doing the latest things, testing new apps. Um, I, I advise a few companies informally. Um, a lot of people reach out to me, to asking me, and I'm, I'm always happy to talk about just my thoughts on VR and AR. And I've continued to blog um, just because it, it fulfills a, <clears throat> an inner need to get my ideas about um, about this out. Um, just be, I, I need to be able to think about it and write about it because it seems too important for me. Um, it just seems way too important for me not to get those ideas out there. And I think that just like any other blogger, like when there's something that where one person looks at it is disappointing versus 20 people and you get really excited, you know, like a seal, you start like, <laughs> um, but honestly, like, I, I don't care. Like, all, if one person looks at it, that's fine. And there's stuff that I don't even publish because I just want to understand it myself. And I, none of us really know where it's going. And we all come at it from a different perspective. And I think that if we have a community of people from different places, different countries, different backgrounds that try to understand where is VR going to go where is AR going to go we have a better chance of making it work um than <clears throat> than if we're all independent or if we're only commercially minded and each one of us is just trying to start our own company so the idea of an ecosystem of creators developers you know in like for me i'm an investor but i'm i also code a little bit i'm also a, a writer I'm, I'm just obsessed with this topic same as you, like, you know, you're a developer, you've been a, you've been an entrepreneur, you're now a blogger, you're, you do interviews, you go to events, like, you know, we're all just trying to find a way to find our, our place within the, the metaverse to, yeah. to uh, Mr. Um, Neil. You, you said that um, you started with VR when you got in touch with the uh, guys of Virtualytics. And I want to ask you, what have you fascinated so much about VR? So I know why you started, but why have you remained in the VR system? So, so the first, the first time that VR just kind of blew me away was um, I I went to to Caltech um, to see this to see what the guys from Virtual Lux had done. This is before the company started. Um, this is work that uh, Professor George Jagorski, um, who runs the, um, he runs the um, astronomy um, <clears throat> and astrophysics department at Caltech. He had been doing this work with some of his colleagues and collaborators for like 10, 15 years. They started in Second Life, creating data visualization in Second Life. And yeah, I know. <laughs> um, they actually had physics conferences for astronomy in Second Life. And then little by little, they started seeing, well, like, how can we do this kind of visualization in VR, right? So as soon as they saw about Oculus, uh, you know, um, the first, the, you know, they, they were, they put in the 300 bucks for the, uh, for the Kickstarter and they were waiting to get it. Um, and when I went, it, you know, it was, you know, the original Oculus. Um, and I, I remember, you know, putting it on and I wasn't really sure what to expect because I had only seen a few videos of what they had been able to do in terms of visualizing data. And they started walking me through it, George and, um, and uh, Ajiro, who's another one of the co-founders, um, who's, who's a data scientist. Um, <clears throat> Michael uh, is, Michael's is the CEO and Jiro are both Italian. So they were 
there was a little bit of a discussion about Milan versus Juventus and stuff like that. But after that conversation, and um, we got that out of the way, um, we we started focusing on the VR and they were like guiding me and they're like, okay, look in this direction and then place this data cube over here. And play. And I was like, no, I'm going to lay lie down on the ground and look at it from below and see if I can live in a VR data space. And they're like, are you sure? We're not really sure if that's going to work. And I was like, no, let me try it out. Let me see what happens. And I, I just remember lying down on the floor and looking up and having this gigantic cube of data floating above me. And I was like, this is so much fun. I was like, I, this is fun, you know, and it was data. Um, and I told them like, I'm pretty sure no one will ever buy this product because they're going to lay down on the ground and spin it uh, on, on top of them. But that's why I love the product. And I was like, I hope somebody wants to buy this, but I want it because I want to, I want to, at two in the morning after the kids are asleep and after, you know, I've already woken up from, you know, being asleep for a few hours. I want to wake up. I want to, I want to put a AK TV with Nirvana on it. And I want to have my three data cubes and I want to spin them. Like, and they were, and they were like, this guy's crazy, but he really likes our product. So maybe we shouldn't, you know, maybe we should take him seriously. <laughs> Amazing. And so for people that don't know what Virtualytics does, so in few words, what is the purpose of Virtualytics? I, I understood that what you said that is about VR and data visualization, mm -hmm. but can you detail this a bit more for my, my readers? Yes, absolutely. So, so Virtualytics, really, the original idea was for you to be able to immerse yourself in your data. So the the company started with patents in the way in which you can visualize various dimensions in vr right so um if you think about it obviously you have three you know the the three um spatial dimensions and uh, and another temporal dimension so you start with four but then you add things like opacity so is it is it or can you see through a particular you know bubble in vr or not size of that particular bubble is it you know is it um, a triangle pyramid or is it a circle um things like that right um so they, they were able to get the patent for mo viewing uh multiple dimensions or high level of dimensions in vr um and that was really like what got things started and then they brought in a bunch of uh, machine learning experts from caltech and and put, started putting in a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms that would apply in real time in, at, at the graphical level, right? So you could, you could have you know, your data, um, let's say it has 20 variables and you, you can apply a machine learning algorithm that says, okay, I want you to, to do some clustering in real time um, and view it graphically and suddenly your data now is clustered into you know three or four clustered using like a k-means algorithm or something like that or you can do like an outlier analysis using one of the many machine learning algorithms that can do that um so that that really started becoming a key part of the product and then the third thing that became a key part of the product was a, a shared virtual office where you can be in the same office right in vr uh as your friends your fellow scientists your fellow collaborators and you're looking at um at these data cubes and interacting with them um so that's kind of how things were at the beginning like in in when, when we first started uh and the company started and moved into its first office in august 2016 um but then things have just kind of skyrocketed from there and you know, what they've done is they give the customer what the customer wants, right? So some customers say, I want a, like a control room where I'm in VR and I want to see like a whole bunch of different screens and I want to walk through it and I get to a screen and I see a dashboard here, I see a dashboard there. Um, some people want 2D dashboards inside a 3D world. Some people want 3D data. Um, some people say, you know what, I'm not that interested in in virtual reality, I just want the machine learning uh, that gets to the conclusions, um, which is sad, but <laughs> which is that sad, is but, but but that's what they want, you know, <laughs> that's what they want. Um, so, so I think you know, thank thank God, 
um, we we've been lucky that the, the the four founders um, are an incredible incredible group. I forgot to mention Scott, who is a head of uh, one of the Mars teams at NASA, um, and he was one of the first people to use the Hololens like anywhere to to visualize how astronauts in some point maybe I don't know twenty thirty seven in Mars would be able to navigate the Martian landscape, and he he and his team created. Uh, a program that uses a hollow lens to allow you to pretend to be on Mars and kind of navigate different waypoints and things like that. He was, he's another one of the co-founders. He's kind of like the AR portion um, of the company and they're all amazing. Um, and, and it's been a great journey. I've gotten to know them all very, very well. They, they've treated me extremely well. And then there's been a lot, you know, there's been a lot of other investors uh, along the ride. Uh, some of which are, you know, pretty amazing people that it's been, it's been great to meet them. Um, so I'm lucky that I was part of that, that story. Um, I think it's pretty cool how I just sent them an email and even though they didn't respond to me for five months because they were working on IP and things like that, I think it's pretty cool that professor Jagorski finally did respond to me, even though I was, a, I had nothing to do with VR. Um, and he said, Hey, let's talk. And you know, from one nerd to another, little by little, you realize a level of nerdiness. And once you pass, once he realized that I had passed the extreme nerd threshold, um, I think he said, well, you know, this might be someone that we might want to partner with. Well, you can't go back after you go up no. that level of nerdiness, you, you can't go no. back. <laughs> but and it's a high threshold. I mean, he teaches Caltech students. So for me to for me to meet his, his nerd threshold was not easy. <laughs> no. And some people may say, okay, but why should they visualize the data in VR on AR? Why uh, computer skin is not enough? So, yeah. well, what's your answer? <laughs> it's a great question. You don't have to. Um, you know, we can, you can, you can, sometimes drawing on a piece of paper is a great way to visualize data. I mean, that, I do that with my IT team all the time. I say, we need a router there, we need a router there, we need a router there, and we draw it on a piece of paper, right? Um, so it, it depends on the nature of the data, right? Um, I think there, there's been, there have been some studies done that try to understand whether visualizing in VR, in VR uh, allows you to have uh, faster or better insights. I think that that's an early research stage. We're not at the point where I could say, look, Tony, here are the hundred studies that show that, right? I'll be lying if I said that. It's an early research stage and we're trying to figure that out. It's just like with, you know, um, depression and anxiety, like, can we treat those better in VR? Maybe, but do we have a hundred, you know, we have 20 years of, of a long, longitudinal studies like we had when Prozac first came out? No, we don't, we're getting started. So maybe one day I can tell you, Tony, you will be able to come to a conclusion faster when you're looking at your data in the Vive Focus. But for now, what I can tell you is one, um, it's just so much, it's so much better. It's just so much more fun um, to, to be floating inside your data, um, which for me is relevant. I, I don't know if it is for other people. But two, in terms of um, multiple dimensions, um, there is a there is a point of diminishing re returns with visualizing data either in 2D or in kind of traditional 3D um, that where you just can't see or really understand that fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimension. Like um, being able to understand that because something is larger, it represents a larger amount. That's not so easy to do and at the same time understand where you are on the X, Y, Z axis. Also understand what the different colors are, what they mean, um, the, the brightness or opacity of a particular um, you know, particle in that, in that data space. Um, and then the inner, so understanding the multiple dimensions, I think you just can't do that in existing technology. And the other thing is the interactivity, right? So. You can, you know, I use, I use um, tools like Click and Tableau um, at work. I mean, I think a lot of people in IT do. 
and they're great tools. I mean, they, they give us what we need to analyze business data, but you just can't do, you can't interact with the data in a way that kind of just flows naturally. For example, with Virtualytics um, and any, with any tool that would allow you to do data visualization in VR or AR, I can, I can spin the data around so that it faces me the way that I want it, right? Um, if the Z axis doesn't make sense to me, I can spin it around because maybe I want to see it from the X axis. Or I could say, you know what, I'd, I'd rather change um, the size of <clears throat> the bubbles that are representing a particular variable. They're too small. I really can't see them. Let me make them huge so I could really understand where the, the largest value is. Um, things like that, where the real slicing and dicing, being able to say, look, I am going to choose everything in the right quadrant on, in this cube and then just focus on that and try to find anomalies there. Um, that's, you can do that. It's not that you can't do that with, with other tools, but you can't do it with your hands. You can't do it with the data in front of you. Um, and there's some things that I definitely found are more intuitive um, when you're in that space. Um, so it's, I can't say that it, every single application will lead to a more intuitive result, but there are definitely some areas where you look at a 2D scatter plot using like, you know, R Studio, for example, which is very common in data science. And you just see like all these dots going in a, and, you know, good luck trying to figure out what that means. Um, but if you then look at those dots in, in three dimensions, suddenly you realize, wait, I see a pattern here. Um, you might not know what that pattern means, but if you have the right tools to apply certain algorithms to it, you might actually figure out what that pattern means, right? Okay, that's, that's, that's super interesting. I, I should try something like that and never visualize some big data in VR. I've seen some samples, but maybe I should try with some bigger data sets. Yeah, uh, I, 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 we would be love to give you a demo. Wow. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're, um, Michael is in, <clears throat> go, is in London all the time. Um, we have, we have customers and investors in Europe, so yeah. that would not be difficult to do. And also, actually, we don't even have to be there. You could, you, you know, you have a rift, you have a rift, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Um, yeah. So, okay. All you have to do is just send them an email, say, give me a demo and, and you'll do a demo. <laughs> it could um, be very cool. I will love yeah. it. And Use your own data. That's the best. That's the best way. Yeah, and I want to talk to you now about another topic because when I discussed with, with you via email, I, you used one term that is mediated reality. Yeah, uh, I was super fascinating, super, super fascinated because it's the first time that I heard those, the the term. So, can you explain what does it mean? Yes. So, so the concept of, of mediated reality is not my concept. It was, um, it was, it was written about uh, by researchers in the, in the mid 1990s. Um, and what it means is essentially um, the ability to change your perception of reality using some kind of augmented reality um, tool set. Right. It doesn't have to be augmented reality. It could be virtual reality. But for me and what I've been focusing on is for augmented reality. So let me give you an, an example of the difference between regular AR and mediated reality. So in regular AR, I, could, I can come here and I can add an object like this guy. Right. And it could be like, OK, there's this object in AR. OK. But if you want to do mediated reality, what you need to do is you need to be able to both add and remove. And then, in, so the first step is you add, so now I have this guy here. Then, um, if I could remove my hand so that it just looks like this guy is flying in real time. Okay, so that in itself would be a combination of augmented and diminished reality. Now, if I can make it seem as if this guy is flying like this, okay, even though he's really not, that's mediated reality. So basically it's a combination of adding objects 
deleting objects in real time and making virtual objects, sorry, making virtual replicas of real objects and having them do things that they're not really doing. So another kind of classical example that I, that I tell to my family and friends when they think that I'm crazy is imagine that, which of course they do. Um, <laughs> like imagine, me. Yeah, <laughs> okay, well. Of course they think that I'm completely crazy, but imagine that I'm, I'm, I'm in my office here and you know, I, I, I have, let's say I have, <clears throat> I have a chair in my office and there's a few things I could do using AR VR, right? One thing is I can, I can scan that chair using some kind of 3D scanning technology. And then I can add a, a, a digital replica, right? A virtual version of that chair to another part of my office. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool. And we know that that can be done. It's not easy, but it can be done. All right, now what if I scan that chair and then I put the virtual replica, but I delete, not, in, not really, but in my visual perception, I delete the original, right? Now what I could do is I can, you know, and let, we're assuming a few things here. For example, we're assuming that we have hand controls and things like that. I can move that chair up and down across my office. In my ver visual perception, that's what's happening. A chair is moving from the floor to the ceiling in my office. In, in real life, nothing is happening, okay? How is this being done? Well, there's a few different methods, right? One that I've written about, which is um, uh, one of the main methods is called in-painting, right? So you get all of the, you get all of the, the colors and the textures around the object that's being replaced and you in-paint so that you kind of, um, you guess um, what, what the background might look like. So if you look at that, um, that poster uh, that I have in my office, which says change, which is to remind everybody that you know, IT is about change and don't come here talking to me about keeping things the same. Um, it, it's pretty easy to guess what's gonna be behind that poster, right? A white wall. Yeah. It's probably not gonna be like, you know, uh, the 16th chapel, unlikely. So <laughs> that one is pretty easy to guess, you know, using in painting. But some things are not so easy. So, you know, for example, if I said, try to guess if removing this jacket, what's going to be under it, you might be able to have a computer vision algorithm that extends these lines and says, well, it's probably going to be this shirt. But what if this shirt has lines here and then it has lines yeah. going down? You can't, it's hard to predict, right? Um, so there are a lot of challenges. Now, I particularly found it really interesting that the company that really perfected diminished reality, which is uh, Fatech in, in, in Germany, was purchased by Facebook at the end of uh, 2017. And then there was nothing else about the topic, right? There's all these amazing presentations given by the two founders um, about diminished reality and everything. And then it was purchased by Facebook. And, and now it's like a, you can't find anything else about them, right? Um, so I've been trying to find out more about diminished reality from some of the researchers in the field. There's an absolutely brilliant researcher in, in Japan. Uh, I've asked him just for some ideas, you know, how do you think it's going to happen? Um, I've, I've reached out to the folks from Sketchfab because, I, you know, I think that, that they're brilliant and they can kind of help me figure out, like, okay, is it possible? And I think the general consensus is like, look, this is possible but it's not happening anytime soon because there are various difficult problems, you know, like we call like um, NP problems, right? It's so problems that are not, uh, that, don't have a, that they don't have a linear computational scale, right? They have, they're exponentially difficult. Um, and one of those is the in-painting problem. How do we replace things in real time? Um, and the other one is, how do you how do you actually create a 3d model that replaces what you're seeing in real time and then move that model around in your environment um without creating distortions you know actually making you realize and think that it's real um i think this is possible i mean i think that i don't know when 
but I think there will be a time when we can do a full 3D scan of a room of our environment. We will have 3D models, relatively good 3D models of every single object in that environment, and we'll be able to move those models and delete the physical object in our visual perception. And in that way, we'll be able to mediate reality, not just augment it, but change it. Um, I don't know when that's gonna happen, but I, I would like it to happen. Um, I want it to happen. And um, this is something that I think is what, it should be one of the end goals. It should be one of the, one of the many end goals of where we're going as an AR VR community. And VR is part of it too, a big part of it, because think about it this way. Um, you're wearing a, a VR headset that has pass through, right? And you do the 3D scanning, and now you have a full 3D scan of your room in VR. And now you're walking in VR through, the, through your room, but what you're seeing in VR is an exact replica of what's actually you know, in your physical environment. And as you go and touch things, right, you're act you actually, you know, get haptic feedback in VR of what's actually there. And you in VR you move things. Now, of course, they're not moving, you're not moving things physically, but in VR you can do anything. It's just unity, it's just C sharp, right? I can turn it into the moon, I could I could turn it into you know the Sixteen Chapel if I, I won't be able to take pictures because they get upset at you, but uh, yeah. But VR is even better, ideally. The ideal, like the, the beautiful, most beautiful implementation is a scan in AR from a VR AR headset, and then you're fully in VR, but you really think that you're there, and then suddenly everything changes, right? You change the color, you change the, who knows, you change the physics. You know, you're set, now you're floating in space because, because you shifted the floor down by two meters. Um, I think that's the most amazing implementation, even more amazing than my chair is flying, you know, but to say, here's my room, and now everything has changed from being, uh, a, you know, a surface that is completely rigid to, you know, like a Salvador Dali painting where things are like, you know, malleable, right? Um, how cool would that be, right? Um, and that's, that's where I would like to go. I mean, that's where my thoughts are going. And I would love to see someone who can get us there, you know, or a group of people. I want the community to get us there eventually. And in your opinion, uh, what will be the, the final goal of this technology? So what can be the uses in 10 years? Maybe we will we'll have that. Um, how do you envision this future of mediated reality? So I think, I think it's a little bit scary because um, if you're a fan of, of David Foster Wallace, who was, you know, a big, a, a, a hero of, of, of super nerds in the U.S. for a while, um, you know, he wrote a book called Infinite Jess. And in that book, um, a lot of people kind of become completely obsessed with a kind of a VR experience to the point that their whole life becomes that, right? So I think that when you can't tell the difference between what's real and what's um, an illusion, so to speak, it's dangerous because there will be some people that will want to be completely into an you know, illusory experience, a, a, a virtual experience, um, whether it be an AR or VR. Um, and so I worry a lot about some of the negative use cases. So for example, if an advertiser can put their brand in you know everywhere that you look right or you know every object can be replaced by um by that advertiser's product <laughs> uh, the thing, right things like that right and, and it can happen right right now you're on the web and you know more and more wherever you go there's more and more um ads there's different types of ads like the other day i was trying to look at an article um and I literally could not read the article because an ad just kept popping up in different ways and different formats. And I just turned off my phone. I was like, I'm, I can't take this anymore um, because I can't, I'm so frustrated. You know, I tried moving it like this. I tried, it now, I tried going like this. There was no way to get rid of the ad. Um, imagine that in, in the AR space, right? Imagine being bombarded 
by ads in the AR space. So um, I'm concerned about that. But on the on the positive side, um, I think that I think that there could be some amazing uses for mental health. Um, you know, I think that uh, for people who suffer from depression, who knows? It could be amazing to just change the color of what they're seeing, right? Um, if they're they're viewing a world um, and everything seems bleak to them, and you just kind of get each one of the objects that they're seeing in real life and somehow illuminate them, make them shine or glow in some fashion, um, that might be something that could actually, you know, activate the you know those neurons, get the serotonin and you know uh, levels up. Who knows? Um, I think there's a lot of possib possibilities for for mental illness in terms of kind of things that could really help the world. Now, in terms of gaming, I mean, it's kind of unlimited, right? Um, what couldn't you do if you could, if you can change, you know, literally change what you're doing, you know, change what you're looking at, right? So uh, at, a, at a mega scale, you can imagine like um, a, a multi massive multiplayer um, AR game where everybody is able to change the, ver the visual perception of their environment. So like, let's say you're in Italy, I'm in the US, and let's say that I, de I decide in this game to go to downtown Miami and get a couple of the buildings and make them fly in the air, right? So, and somehow there's persistence around that activity. You fly in, Okay, you land in Miami and you put on your air glasses on. And when you look at it, those buildings are flying in the air. So now I've changed my perception of reality, but now you share that changed perception of reality. Okay. So now it's kind of like a game or, or a social network. Um, and you can imagine that people, people can say, well, you know what? We, we're going to get this particular space. Let's say, I don't know, Central Park. And we're going to turn Central Park um, in this AR world or in this VR world um, into a, a huge museum. You know, whatever you want. Um, a huge museum of, of medieval art. I don't know. It's, it's whatever you want to. So when you go to Central Park, you're going to walk into that museum of medieval art. And you'll just be walking on the grass. Hopefully you don't fall, right? There's some rocks. But you'll be looking. Okay, so here's, here's the... It'll be like being um, in the Uffizi Gallery, but in Central Park, right? Um, and I'll be able to see it, and you'll be able to see it, but only because we're both part of this AR uh, space that we've created. Um, and it kind of goes back to, uh, to you know, some books that have influenced me, you know, particularly, um, my God, I'm, 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 how could I forget? Um, but there's some very, very important um, books uh, that talk about AR that um, that, I've, that have been very influential, which for some reason, I cannot remember the name of it. Um, for sure, it will happen after the interview. As soon as we stop you, ah, that yeah, was I the know. name. <laughs> I know. Don't worry. And talking about um, AR and MR and whatever. I know that you you like a lot Magic Leap and what Ronnie is doing in Florida. It is yeah uh, where you are. So why do you like this headset too, so much? Do you like the device? Do you like the vision? Do you like that it's in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> so so about the device, I, I cannot give any technical like honest technical advice because I don't own one and I've never tried one. Oh. So, that, so that would be dishonest for me to even try to do, say that. What I like is um, I, I really like uh, Ronnie's vision uh, because of the fact that, um, first of all, he had, he had already, you know, been able, he was already very successful with, um, uh, with the robot, with robotics company. Um, and from there, you know, he took a big risk, which was, you know, let me, now I'm going to do this, this AR company. And he knew that he was going to have to compete against um, the big players, uh, Microsoft and the Googles of the world. Um, and yet he said, I'm going to try this out my own. I, I'm going to try to create, uh, you know, the hardware, which is, you know, the hardest part of this. 
And I mean, I think that if you take kind of the funding cycle out of it, because, you know, the funding is the kind of the typical VC funding that everybody um, goes through. And I don't, I don't blame him, you know, for taking VC money. I mean, it, that's kind of the way the game is played. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but what I think that he's done is he's inspired people to believe in where AR could go. I mean, and that's not to take away from what HoloLens has done, because I think that, that what the right researchers at Microsoft have done over many years and what HoloLens has done is a huge step forward for AR. But I think what Ronnie's done is try to make it fun, try to make people think about how AR can be a cr part of the creative universe. Uh, if you look at like some of the early, you know, some of the early applications where you're mixing sound uh, with 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 movements of your hands and things like that, yeah, the, the synesthesia, you know what I mean? It's like a combination of of music and 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 visual all at the same time. And I like that vision. Um, of course, I love the fact that we went to the same university, not at the same time, um, but we're both graduates of University of Miami. Uh, he's from South Florida. I'm from South Florida. He's an hour, you know, his, his company is an hour away. I love the fact that now we have a, an important tech company in South Florida, which we didn't really have before. Um, so we have an AR presence in South Florida. That's a beautiful thing. And it's not, we're, that's not something that we're used to. Right? We're not LA, we're not San Francisco. But, so yeah, I don't know him personally, but I admire the guy. I really do. Um, and I really hope that he's successful. Um, and I know there's tons of criticism and probably a lot of that is deserved because anybody who gets into the, into the VC game, so to speak, is, you know, is going to deserve criticism because in the end, look, you can just have a, a, a company that is profitable and that runs off of revenue and can probably help creators and can probably make a nice product. And you don't have to play the VC game. You don't have to raise you know, a valuation of $2 billion. But, you know, I don't feel like I'm in a position to criticize him for that, given the fact that I'm playing that game as an angel investor. So, you know, don't throw rocks at glass buildings, right? Yeah. <laughs> and since you're uh, an investor, um, in your opinion, so well, what is the most important thing that you look at when deciding if investing in a company or another? Because for some investor is the team, for some other is the idea. What is the, the most important feature for you? 100% the team. Um, that's the only thing that matters to me. Um, I think that, you know, all, a lot of us in this space have great ideas. For example, I think I have some great ideas, but that doesn't mean that I would expect someone to come in and give me money for it. Um, just because my idea is good because probably Tony and another five people can have that idea and they can do it better than I can. Um, so I think it's a little bit, um, you have to be humble and realize that your idea might be really good, but there's always someone who could do it better than you. Um, and there's always someone who's probably thought about it in a way that's, that can be implemented better than you. Um, so for me, it's completely about the team and I have only made one investment, which is Virtualytics. Um, I, I've looked at many other companies since then and I've made a lot. I, and I tell people, you know, I've only made one investment. I'm not even sure if I'll make another investment because I've learned so much over the last two years about everything, all of the things that need to be done for a company to be successful. In other words, by seeing Virtualytics success and how hard they've worked to get that and some of the lucky breaks, I've realized how difficult it is to actually be lucky to have all those things come together. So I know now I really understand when they say, you know, 99% of startups fail. Now I see why I've seen all the different places where you can. And I just feel lucky that the Virtualytics founders and the investors who've come in since then have found a way to navigate around that for now. Um, so I've been l less motivated to invest with every month of, of, of learning more about, about the industry. But I always want to learn about companies. And I think one day I will see a company that I will say, you know what? Um, this is a team that's similar to the team that I saw at Virtualytics. 
And you know what? It's, it's time for me to take another risk. But it's 100% about the team. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm going to invest in an idea that has no merit. It, obviously, I need to be wowed by the idea. You know, I, it needs to be something where I say, oh, my goodness, I want that. Like, call me back so we can do that again. You know, so there has to be a product that you can at least have a really nice demo that really surprises me. Um, but yeah, it's about the team. Uh, for me, it's about, am I going to be able to work with these people? Are they going to be able to be stewards of my investment? I mean, this is, this is, you know, I don't have, you know, I don't have, um, just money to, to be throwing around and say, let's see what happens. You know, when I make an investment, like that money, it has to go somewhere or else I'm going to have less money 20 years from now and my kids are going to have less money. So I'm taking real risks here and I, I'm not going to take those risks unless I understand at a very deep level what these people are about, you know, because the first two years will be completely different from year three and year four, and they'll be completely different from year five and year six. I want to know if the company goes bankrupt, how are you going to treat me? You know, if you're able to sell this company, how are you going to treat me? Um, and what other kinds of people are you going to associate your, yourself with? And what are the ethics of your company? Are you going to be honest? Are you going to treat your employees well? Um, are you going to grow just because you got money and you want to please a venture capitalist or are you going to be responsible with the way that you use that money you know that's what really matters to me um I, maybe that sounds a little soft or it sounds a little bit um touchy-feely but maybe because for me the, the the risk level is higher you know i'm not like this super wealthy like mega investor that just throws a little bit here throws a little bit there you know I really need to feel like, like these founders are going to treat me. They're going to treat me like another founder. They're going to listen to me. They're going to, they're going to listen to what I say and they're going to do the right thing. You know, they're going to be ethical. Um, and you know, and they're going to treat everybody else. Right. Um, I, I don't want to be partnering with someone who's going to treat me well and then treat everybody else terribly. So, um, that, that's the main thing, really. Well, that, 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 that's what I uh, would like to have from investor as well. So I don't like people just giving, okay, this is the money, so now make yeah. it age. So <laughs> what's the point of this? I also want to be guided, to have someone to talk with, and so on. So compliments for your vision and continue this way. And instead of talking about marketing, I said that um, I've seen that on Twitter you're very active, especially in fostering debates about the future of VR and AR. Yeah, I talk about how to, for instance, the last question was about how to write in VR. Right, uh, keyboard series. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of ideas. So I want to, to ask you uh, something about that. So, uh, why do you, you foster this debate and what have you learned in, from all these questions and, and also how to create a healthy debate because in VR I also see people just say, oh, Facebook, I hate them, HTC, yeah. too, too expensive, all people yeah. just talking about a lot of hate and useful, useless stuff. Uh, right. Instead, you, you're fostering a lot of interest in debate, even people with different opinions and such. So it's just an open question about how to make debate in VR and VR and um, what, is, what, will, what will take this, what will be the fruits and so on. No, that's, that's a great question. I mean, so <laughs> I, the, you know, the initial idea of, of um, getting on Twitter and getting to know people in the VR and in AR space was because I wanted to know what people were saying, right? Um, and this is even be before I became an investor, um, uh, before I even started blogging. I just, I wanted to know what are people saying in the space? And I found that Twitter was a great place to find out what people were saying. And um, there are people who, um, <clears throat> 
there are people who are constantly posting great content and I can just follow them on Twitter and I can see what's the latest. I don't have to go and search for things, you know, um, all day. Then, you know, I started realizing that there are communities on Twitter. People talk to each other. People actually comment and retweet and say, hey, how did you do this? How did you do that? People sh show their products, say, hey, can you try my product? And um, what do you think about this implementation? And I started seeing that there were some people that did a really good job of that, that they built community. So I've been experimenting um, over the last few years on Twitter on how to build community. Um, and I think we're lucky because, for example, um, people like yourself uh, who are very active on Twitter, uh, Rick King, who is very active on, on Twitter, and some of the other um, like top influencers, these, I have found, are like really nice people who, if they think that there's an idea that's worth talking about, you know, they'll retweet it, they'll comment on it, they'll say, hey, what do you guys think about that? So I started thinking, well, there's so many of us on Twitter who are working on all kinds of different things in the AR VR space. There's entrepreneurs, there's, um, there's uh, the most important, right, which is the creators, the developers, right, because you can't have VR and AR without people who know how to make it. You have investors, you have VCs, you have people who are just interested. Um, and we're all thinking about the same questions. I mean, this is like the early days of the internet um, where everybody was thinking, what's going to be the, the browser for the internet, right? Remember in the AOL days when there was no browser and, you know, we, we chatted on AOL chat rooms and then Netscape came out and we're like, oh my God, Netscape, you know, and it's like, what is this? What does this mean? Do I need to log in through AOL or should I use Netscape? So these are the kinds of questions that people have. And I think that we don't have kind of um, an organized place where we can talk about them. I think there are people like Malia Probst, for example, or Kent Bai, who they have fantastic podcasts and they bring in people and they say, what do you think? Right. Or they even have panels and things like that. But I wanted to create a community on Twitter of people just giving their honest opinion. Um, and sometimes you're right. It, it devolves into, it goes in the wrong direction. Like, Oh, um, I hate this company because they're trying to destroy the world or whatever. Um, or they'll say like, you know, if, if it's not, if you're not giving it free, if it's not open source, then it's complete BS. Um, or, or there are people who they have a, there's one company that they really like and they'll just be like, check out my company, check out my company, check out my company. But, um, my, my commitment is I ask a question. Um, I tag the people who I know have thoughts on this matter and you can tag 10 people on an image, right? Um, so I tag 10 people on that image who I think will talk about it. And then any answer, I retweet the answer unless it's offensive to me. Um, and when I can, um, I try to add into the conversation, but it's not about me. And honestly, my opinions and my ideas are not by far, not the most interesting. I just kind of get the conversation started and then it's amazing the kinds of, the kinds of, um, you know, points of view that come in and then you have all these side conversations. It's like a tree, you know, that you just plant the seed and then it's like, okay, the seed is, keyboards, gestures, voice. And then there's like a whole voice conversation, a whole conversation about, uh, you know, keyboards. There's a whole conversation about gestures and it just kind of, you know, trickles down, you know, like neural net. <laughs> um, and it's a beautiful thing. And I think it helps us to feel like we have a family, um, a community of people who, uh, who love VR, AR, and who want to talk about it. You know, Maybe there's a better way of doing it. I know a lot of people have tried to do Slack channels. The problem with Slack is that if you do want to talk about your product, your blog, or whatever, it's not going to be available to everyone. So in Twitter, there, you know, there's a there there's a balance. But you you can say, you know, hey, uh, why doesn't why don't you guys try out this particular 3D scanning technology? I think that you might be interested in it, and that's fine. And then that might lead to a conversation. What's annoying is if someone posts that every time, no matter what the conversation is. But if we're having a conversation about what's more important, 
having great 3D models or having a great repository for 3D models, which is one of the conversations that I started a few weeks ago, that's completely relevant. I mean, you should be telling me, tell the world about your 3D scanning technology, you know? And it's like, we're all together having a conversation. Um, and I think that's a really nice thing. There are ways of making it better. In fact, I would love to have your advice on how you think, how you think that we can make the VR AR community better um, because you've been able to do that in many ways through the newsletter, through these interviews. Um, you know, I would love to hear your advice on how do we do that better? Because right now it's just an experiment of, Hey, discuss amongst yourselves, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think that we, we could have a group interview about that as well, because it's a very complicated topic because um, I think that, as you said, the problem is also in finding the right medium because when you create these debates on Twitter, the problem is that the Twitter line is not ideal to see this tree. So sometimes it becomes a complete mess to understand, oh, what was this man talking about? Yeah, <laughs> you have to see the context, the context to understand what it's about. Uh, the only thing that I think I love what you're doing because I think it's very important that you're fostering debate. And I also think that we, we all have, have to have a positive attitude because the, we have to make other people understand that there is possible and it is fundamental a positive um, uh, debate about uh, of people about the RMBR. Sometimes there is not a right solution. There is also things that we must try. So I always try, at least in my social media, to have a positive attitude. Sometimes I'm ironic uh, towards some companies like about Magic Leap. I sometimes I'm very like, sarcastic about what yeah. we've done. No, we had, a, we had a really good back and forth, which was hilarious. About. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that. That was great. I mean, because look, I'm, I'm, I'm also, uh, uh, I'm also very skeptical. I am, you know, I can be very sarcastic. I can be very cynical. Um, just because, you know, I'm a tech nerd. We're all cynical. None of us think that anything is really going to work because we know when you try something on, everything breaks, right? <laughs> so we have to get a, We have to go around our instinct, right? as engineers, as tech nerds, we have to go our, around our instinct, which is our instinct is to tell people, yeah, it's not so easy. Oh, you no, it's not just about plugging it in and, and, and plugging it back in. Okay. Like I know more about this than you do. Right. I think we have to go against our instinct and say, maybe this can actually work. Or if it doesn't work, maybe it will lead to something else. Um, especially since so many of the startups in the space are going to fail. It's just reality, you know? It's just, just like any other space. They need support. I mean, they need someone who's gonna tell them, guys, keep going. Like, we need you, we need your research. And the, the people doing research at, the universe, at universities on AR and VR, they need our support too. They need to know there's a community of people who are gonna, who are gonna talk about my papers, who are gonna say, look at what this guy did. This researcher just did a beautiful paper on photogrammetry. And that might sound like the nerdiest thing, but for that person, that could really make a difference in their life. Um, and try not to think about the commercial implications of it. I mean, all of us want to make money, obviously. And all of us want to have the maximum commercial benefit of everything we do because I don't know, Adam Smith said that that's how our minds work. Um, of course, if you don't believe Adam Smith, you know, you could look at it from the Mark, Mark's perspective and say, we all just want to help each other and we're born that way. I think we're somewhere in the world, okay? I think we all want to get maximum utility, but we do have a heart. And as a community, we can help each other without always just thinking, you know, how do I make a buck out of this, right? Um, and if we have enough people like that, who, who are not just thinking, how do I make money off of this? But how do I, how can I help this guy? Or how can I help this girl? And just say, hey, by the way, I saw this particular algorithm for, for, for this. Why don't you try it out? You know? And if you know what's a great example? I mean, 
remember Fermat's last theorem, and I'm a math nerd, so it's okay if you're if 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 you're not as into this as I am. But the guy who solved Fermat's last theorem, he spent ten years on his own in Oxford, hacking away at it, and he finally and he finally uh, found the solution. I don't want that to be the way that we figure out foveated rendering or, you know, 8K at 90 FPS, or I don't want that to be the way that we figure out mediated reality or, or the way that we figure out this is the, the killer app of VR. I don't want it to be one guy 10 years in, in their VR lab. You know, how sad is that? You know, and I don't want that to be the way it should be all of us together. Yeah. Some of us are going to make a ton of money. Great, congratulations, um, and I and I wish all those people well. And of course, I I hope Virgilitics does incredibly well because it make me money, and that'll make me very happy because I can you know get a bigger house or something like that. Nobody nobody doesn't like money, but I really would love it if we can say ten years down the road we did it as a community, um, as opposed to oh hey that one guy figured out VR. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree like with you. Maybe we can discuss about this later on in private because I think we, we should do something about that. And just my final two questions. The first is, what about your future? I also read on LinkedIn that you're passionate about going to Mars. So are you yeah. planning here on Earth to develop VR or you're flying away to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> So this is uh, some uh, my friend uh, Scott, who's one of the founders of uh, of Virtualytics. He really started getting me thinking about this because when I when I first visited um, his lab in, in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, he showed me you know the the Mars 2020 uh, rover, and when I saw you know the le the the level of extreme detail an obsessive quality that goes into that. And, and I saw the passion from Scott and from his team, and he's on the AR side and you know user interface side. But when I saw how passionately he was speaking about NASA, about JPL, about Caltech, about sending you know, the, this uh, rover to Mars, um, I started thinking to myself like, this is, there are a huge number of unbelievably intelligent people around the world who are focused on trying to understand Mars. And I really thought maybe in our lifetime, there will be the ability to go there. And I thought, what could be, of all the goals that you can have as, an ex, as a science, as a tech nerd, what could be a more fun goal than to go to Mars one day, you know? So obviously, I don't have the ability to make it happen like someone like Elon Musk or, you know, <laughs> or Jeff Bezos, but um, I want to support the people who are building the technology, who are coming up with the, you know, with all of the different, who are fixing all the different huge challenges that will get there one day. And if there, you know, if there is um, the ability to go, um, I, of course, I this would be discussed with my family, <laughs> as it, we've discussed it many times. I've discussed it with my wife, Rachel, many times. And uh, my kids, I don't think they really know. I think they think I'm just joking around, but we have like a million Mars books all over the house. But yeah, I mean, look, if it's 2037 um, and they say you can go to Mars and it's relatively safe and you can go and come back in three years, yeah, for sure, I'm going to go. Um, I'm not going to miss out on that opportunity. Um, so if it's one of those situations where it's like, okay, you can go and you might not come back. All right, it's a little bit different. <laughs> like, well, okay. How good is it over there? <laughs> and so let's close this interview with a final advice for people that are listening to you are reading the transcriptions. So what's your advice to, to people in this ecosystem, maybe that are entering now in the R and the R ecosystem? So my advice would be, you know, especially to the, to the entrepreneurs out there, look, m the vast majority of, of the companies are not going to be these 10 hundred million dollar companies. Um, and it shouldn't be that way. It's, it's ridiculous to think 
that every company in a particular ecosystem needs to have a $1 billion valuation. That doesn't make sense. Economically, what makes sense is that there are various players in an ecosystem that put together a product that as a market can have billions of dollars in sales, right? It's like if you look at the 747, right? There are God knows how many companies that make all the components of the 747. Some of those companies are really small and they just make like the wing tip. Uh, and some of those companies are really huge and they make the whole chassis, right? So everybody has a role to play. If we all try to be billion dollar companies, if we all try to be the Boeing of VR, we will never have VR. We'll never have the VR and AR that we want to have. So I think my main advice is like, just try to do your part. Don't focus so much about, you know, am I going to get VC funding? Am I going to be able to, you know, be that 10x company? But just try to do your part. If, if, if the company um, doesn't last very long because you run out of cash, that's okay. You've made a contribution and then continue making contributions however you can. Um, that, that's my, my main advice. But I think the interesting thing, which and I think it's important to point out just to, so that I don't sound like a hypocrite here is look, I'm here in my day job, right? I have a salary, I run an IT department. I don't do VR, AR full time. So clearly it's not an easy thing to commit to um, because it's a very risky thing. So I, you know, I think we really need to support the people who take the jump and say, we're going to do this full time. They need to have the support of the, of, of an ecosystem. And they also need to know you don't need to develop a billion dollar company. You know, that's, that's not, shouldn't be your goal. You just need to build a component that eventually will be part of this ecosystem and that will get us where we need to go. Um, and I think if we think of it that way, we have a better chance 10 years from now of having the, the VR AR that we would like than if you have a hundred different people all trying to be the billion dollar company, right? Because that's impossible, right? There's only so much money in the economy. We're not going to have $10 trillion going to VR. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that, that's, that's an amazing advice. So um, thank you for your time, Andy. It's been a really amazing interview. I love your passion a lot. I uh, hope to meet you around in communities. Um, so thank you. Uh, have a nice day. All right. Thank you so much, Tony. It's been my pleasure, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you. And thank you for all the wonderful blogging and I would say leading the community that's because that's really what you do to us to a large degree. I mean, you keep us, you keep us thinking, you keep us really trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so, so, you know, thank you so much for that. And, and I, I would, the advice that I would give you is please don't stop doing what you're doing because you inspire everybody else. We need, we need your, your inspiration to continue to feel excited about what we're doing. <laughs> thank you a lot.